What's up, everybody? Welcome to Respect Our Authorita Wisecrack South Park Podcast. My name is Jared. I'm joined here with the authoritarians. We got Lux. Yo. And Amanda. Hey. And Jacob. Hey. All right. So today we're breaking down South Park Season 22, Episode 8, Buddha Box. As always, actually, I'm going to do some guessing first. Let's see. I'm going to guess that Amanda is going to give this an F. I'm going to guess that Lux is going to give it a D, and I think that Jacob is going to give it a B minus. Wow. Uh, how did I do? Let's start with let's start with Amanda. Let's go in order of my guessing. Amanda, what did you think? <laughs> um, I actually would go more B B minus on oh, this wow. one. I know that it's like it should be everything I hate, but <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about why it's not. And maybe I'm just feeling benevolent because I love this season so much. But yeah, I didn't hate it as much as I should have. All right. Okay. What do you think? What about you, Lux? Um, I'm I'm pretty much with Amanda on the BB minus. Actually, it like did a bunch of things that I didn't like, but also did a bunch of things that I did like. And I think that the things I didn't like were more because of like time and it's a 20 minute show than like laziness or anything. So I, I don't know. I feel like it executed a lot of goals. Like it did what it was trying to do pretty well. All right, Jacob. I'm mad because you're dead dead right. <laughs> it was like B minus. <laughs> okay. B minus. I'd give it. Yeah. I thought it was. It was again like every episode to me has been like better the second viewing, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I like what it made me think about more than what I actually thought the episode itself was. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I agree with that. On. Well, yeah, it's pretty it, pretty on point, I think. Wow, interestingly enough, I think I did I didn't really like this episode. This is my least favorite favorite episode of the season. I felt that it was too on the nose. I feel like it didn't it it, it didn't. The story just kind of tread water too much. Like, there wasn't anything crazy happened. It seemed very on the nose. There was no man, bear, pig versus Satan. It didn't go Mm. into ridiculous territory. It seemed to just be a... Exactly. A pretty on the nose discussion of anxiety and phones. And I felt like the Buddha box thing should have gotten crazier. Like, instead of just more people having the Buddha boxes on their head, I would have preferred if... I don't know, they literally like stuck phones in your fucking head or something like that. It just needed to get more ridiculous. Another thing is this episode made me feel old. There was like, (laughs) like I was, phones being used to quell anxiety. Is that even a thing? I don't think so at all. Like, well, Well, again, I I like what it's, I think they're making like a little bit of like a metaphor jump here of like phones is like a retreat from like the sort of atmospheric anxiety of like 2018. So I don't think people with like, as someone who has like a diagnosed anxiety thing, which like who cares? But like I don't know, my phone doesn't give me less anxiety; it gives me a lot more anxiety right. most of the time. And I think Although we, we... there is, when you're feeling socially awkward, a phone is a pretty convenient tool. That's just a tip from yeah, this e- anxious person. It's an easy, right? It's an easy escape. It gives you something to do. It keeps your hands, your hands, and your mind idle, or your your eyes idle. People can't mm-hmm. seem to like stand. I was in an airport recently. People can't even seem to be in like the, those transfer trains without having their phone just because they can't really stand still and just look at nothing. Right. It really is tough. But I think there's a leap being made. I don't know if it's directly tied to like headspace and apps like that, but there's like this sort of Mm -hmm. idea of like you're going to use your phone to escape and calm yourself because everyone has anxiety. Everyone needs a sense of calm. And why not use this technology, which is pushing the boundaries of your ability to experience calm and less anxiety? And then again, I think the episode kind of comes at the end as sort of like the – it's kind of like a no shit Sherlock kind of like, oh, well, phones might actually be causing more distraction and more anxiety. Well, see, that to me is like duh. It is duh. No, yeah. no, that, no, no, that's what I'm saying. It's not that that uh, profound an episode. Like the outcome isn't that exciting. But but that's sort of, yeah, where we land, which is where I think we're already – we already a, are. There was another example in this episode where I was like, okay, I feel like this is making some sort of commentary on some real world thing that I just don't get. And it was when the PC babies are getting a record deal and the the record guy, the label guy was like, this is what people like. They like woke music. And I'm just like, I don't listen to any woke music. Is this even a thing? I'm not even aware of this. Right. So it just made me feel old. Yeah. <laughs> the fact uh, that I was old was kind of checking email. I was like, kids don't want, don't read email. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, not this completion. This episode, I can get more of this after the recap. Like the thrill thing, this episode, there were like three plot lines that could have been whole episodes that all got, I think, way less time they could have, and so all three kind of came out kind of half baked. Yeah. Anyway, all right, let's go into a recap. So, overwhelmed by everything that has happened this season, Cartman is diagnosed with anxiety so that he can get away from people and just have quality one-on-one time with his phone. 
Meanwhile, PC Principal and Strong Woman are struggling to raise five PC babies while keeping them and their relationship a secret. Cartman gets so frustrated with people trying to bother him when he's treating his anxiety with quality phone time that he creates the Buddha Box, a box that shuts you out from the world and projects your phone two inches from your fucking face. <laughs> Cartman convinces others in town to use the Buddha box, including PC Principal, who uses it to shut out the incessant crying of the PC babies. When Strong Woman puts on the box and PC Principal leaves, the PC babies escape to problematize everything. More and more people in South Park are using the Buddha box as Strong Woman and PC Principal search for the PC babies who have just been signed to a major label. When Kyle tells Cartman that everyone has anxiety, he appeals to the mayor to consider anxiety an epidemic and provide everyone in town with a Buddha box. Having heard their children on the radio, PC Principal and Strong Woman pick them up from the studio when they discover that they missed out on seeing their children's first protest, and they realize that they need to promote less time on your phones. But nobody is listening. Everyone is in their Buddha boxes, so they seize the opportunity to live their secret lives out in the open as a family. End of episode. I actually really like the ending. No, the ending is great. The ending yeah. is one of the best parts of the video or the, of the episode yeah also did anyone else notice that pc principal that his sunglasses looks a lot like wisecrack writer matthew terrio <laughs> i did not notice that no but that's <laughs> hilarious <laughs> legitimately striking <laughs> we just released our video on the incredibles this morning and i was telling jared i said buddy looks like like lux <laughs> <laughs> with true. that with that red hair <laughs> that. To be fair, my hair is brown i'm just always wearing a beanie uh, a red beard well red beard Really? Uh, I always thought of yeah. you as the a, a fellow Woody Allen redhead Jew. No, my hair is brown. Oh. Why do I, I just have that? a bright red beard because my face doesn't match itself? Um, <laughs> but um, on the thing you said, so Carmen doesn't buy, doesn't invent the Buddha box, right? He buys it. Which yeah, I is, couldn't really tell. Well, that this again, out of seemingly out of nowhere, we had the commercial for a Buddha box. We had a commercial yeah. for PC babies. I think they look just like making fake commercials. Yeah, I, but, I, I like that. I like the idea of him buying it though, and it being a product because mm -hmm. um, it's part of the riff. Like Jacob, you mentioned stuff like headspace and things like that. I think totally. part of the riff and what part makes it really funny in the aesthetic of the Buddha box. Because there are so many things that tap into like new agey, like proto Buddhist principles mm -hmm. that only pick and choose the Buddhist principles are engaging with, right? Like, if there's like the sort of material desire as an issue kind of thing, selling peace as a product is sort of counterintuitive to that, right? Yes. No, um, I, 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 I found a funny dichotomy there. So I like to think that he bought it at least because that adds like another yeah. joke that I was really into. And piggybacking off of that, what was really interesting to me and what really was what made me not dislike this episode was that even though they were making fun of PC-ness, they were also pointing out like two major things about appropriation, which is firstly, like Lux was saying, the commodification of Buddhism and then like white people kind of pretending they invented mindfulness when it's existed for like centuries. Um, and then the like the white babies being like bastions of wokeness, I feel like it was also kind of a commentary. So I feel like it was actually like they were making their own kind of PC commentary. It just was like they were just talking about wh what kind of um of of like PC ness we well you know what like they were they were making fun of like rash PCness where you yell at people for saying one thing you don't like, but also making commentary about appropriation. Right, like that was the thing that made this episode a little frustrating. Or one, I mean, okay, so this is gonna be a theme of reasons why I'm frustrated with this episode is that like they didn't do the work to draw distinctions of like types of PC babies, right? Like the PC babies they're making fun of would literally never know where the funding from a viaduct they don't like came from. Like they don't do that research. <laughs> like that's not what Tumblrism is, mm -hmm. right? And that's like what they're making fun of. And so there's this weird dichotomy of like the people who are out there like doing groundwork and like protesting and shit and like researching and, and taking up causes like aren't just whining about nothing they have reasons um and they're not the people who like will yell at you for calling a cosmopolitan a pussy drink but they are that's not their sort of main goal like most smart activists know that that's not really the fight to fight right uh, and so it's like it's a little muddy and so like they're not giving like a clear pc take they don't give a clear anxiety take for reasons we can get into then because i have a lot of praise and scorn for that part of it <laughs> and they don't develop like this don't fully develop any of the takes on anything it's like two thirds of an idea for every single subsection. Um, I, and it's like funny and there's cool stuff, but also at the end of the day, like you can't quite get to anything cool because like there's just not. But what I really loved about the ending though, 
is that the, uh, so was very good. Well, but you have PC principal and strong woman have both defined themselves and labeled themselves as professional. They're strong. They're PC. They will not embark on a relationship. They will. It, it's it's not going to be requited love. And yet, it's only when they sort of are able to shed that that label of themselves and that identity for themselves that they're actually happy. So, like these these even like those those lines between uh, yeah, what's PC and what's not, and what's offensive and what's not. Once they are comfortable enough to like shed that, because no one is watching, because no one is listening, um, then they're able. Then that's their liberation, right? Away from the technology too, and everyone else, but. More than anything, right. I mean, there is a nice, conscious. There is a nice hell is other people element to this. Oh sure, <laughs> right. Like everything, everything, all the shitty stuff about those dynamics is all like relational and like socially constructed or whatever. And so once all that shit goes away, they can just be like, oh, who cares? Right. It uh, also weirdly ties together with the anxiety point that like the best way to overcome anxiety is to realize that nobody gives a shit about what you're doing. Yes. So I thought that tied together nicely. And that's very yeah, that's very Buddhist and very stoic. Like who gives mm. a shit if you can't control it? Fuck it. So um. Yeah, I thought like t- you're you're making a point earlier, Lux, about like this decoupling. There's this big criticism in Western Buddhism about taking the three main tenets of Buddhism, one of which is mindfulness or meditation, but the other two being wisdom and ethics, and then just decoupling and picking and choosing the portions that you'd want, and yet still being able to use names like Buddha. So I love the line where it's like, order today, and you too can have quality, uninterrupted time with your phone, just like the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or the great line at the end when uh, Carvin's like, namaste, and the guy goes, namaste, and Carvin goes, yeah, fuck you too. Is it imply like, namaste, and he's like, fuck you, I'm on my right. phone. Or, or, or the line, I mean, namaste, which which means what the fuck which off? Which means I have anxiety. Fuck you, yeah. or something like yeah. that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Well, I also like that in during the ad that we have one of the the guys. He says, "I want to be enlightened like the Buddha, but I've got these fucking kids." kids. Well, you know, interesting. Also, so the Buddha, the Buddha himself was criticized, right? Like Buddhism is known as a non-family type religion. You think about the story of Siddhartha Gautama. He's like a man who leaves his family, leaves mm-hmm. everybody to go escape into the woods and just spend years and years and years without his family because those fucking kids. Yeah. And like even Buddhist practice today, like it encourages you to go out and spend months on retreat and spend months and months, even years <laughs> alone and to leave your family behind and leave everything else behind. Oh, so it's funny. very fucked up. Like in a sense, it's, it is kind of encouraging you to like take off. So like I'm just I'm playing with both sides no, of this great. and I think I, it's interesting, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. much about Buddhism. It seems to fit quite well with <laughs> with the commentary. Yeah, no, it is. It's I'm glad you're here, Jacob, because I feel like yeah. this is an area you're an expert on. The rest no, well, of I'm learning. Very yeah, Re- I'm learning. Recent it, but, expert. I'm re- a recent expert. I'm learning a lot about it. But uh, the I will say this episode definitely. It was like birth control for me. I do not want kids. Like this. <laughs> everyone, like the kids are screaming and the baby. Every time that noise came on, I was like, "Oh yeah, no, oh, I don't, yeah. The, don't want children." The well, there's also this element of. Do you feel like there's a anxiety of if you're gonna have kids, they're probably gonna grow up listening to PC music and being PC, like, in, <laughs> or is it just that PC principal and strong woman, PC is in their genes. <laughs> I don't know. I do like, like when they, when uh, the guy was like consoling the baby. He's like, "Who's gonna be the the bright big future? Who's oh, gonna?" Right, what is right. it? Oh uh, yeah, that was one of the lines I heard. Oh, yeah, that. He, he, that was he the said... line that I lo- that was made my favorite line the whole thing, just because like that's like I know that I, I draw this distinction between like Tumblrism and activism on the show a lot, but I think it's a real thing, and that's like mm-hmm. so the, like Tumblr internet activist like the thing is there's like. I called a coffee shop racist. Everyone tell me how good I am for the future. Um, and that's so like what they're criticizing that moment because like, you know, call a coffee shop racist, whatever, organize a boycott, like be a fucking activist about it. Um, and the people who just like sort of like whine and complain, they are just like whining pats on the back for like being the future. But like, that's not, it's not earned. And I really fucking love that. Like the show is smart enough to like delve into like that element of the, kind of whininess that I don't like. Mm-hmm. And like the superficiality of a lot of like PC scenes like it's easier to get mad at the person who says black Russian than it is to actually like think about how to deal with structural racism. I so. to, well, yeah, I'll take that off the menu. <laughs> Or I didn't even know there was a thing called a black Russian. I don't think they're real. It's just basically no milk. <laughs> no, there is oh. like a white Russian without milk. Okay. Hmm. When I saw the promo for this episode, you know, South Park Studios will release like a clip a couple days before the what episode. Was the it was the clip where Cartman is in the bathroom telling Craig, hey, you ever have problems with Tweak? Wouldn't you like a Buddha box? And I was actually hoping that the whole episode was going to be about Craig and Tweak's relationship again mm. and that the Buddha box was going to be like a B plot that is that 
affects their relationship. But instead, it was really just we never even got to see Craig and Tweak again, and that was kind of a disappointment for me. I, I just didn't think the Buddha box fuck had you an episode about anxiety without Tweak being a central part of the fucking episode. Yeah. That's so, the craziest shit in the world to me. So <laughs> that was something I was thinking about. Like, why would they make Craig the one with anxiety when Tweak is so obviously the best character to represent anxiety? But I think that it's because they're saying, like, they're distinguishing between real anxiety and like. The the the, bull, the he, excuse to be able, to be an asshole, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which I th- so I, was, I think that was a conscious decision because obviously Tweak genuinely seems to suffer from anxiety. All right, I'll apply you conscious decision and raise the ante and say it's a bad decision because the what a more compelling episode of more compelling versions episode would be that Tweak's the one confronting Cartman about being bullshit about anxiety because he actually has anxiety in like a real way and like that would be way better like, wouldn't that have been a much more like like the Tourette's episode or something where Carbon's juxtaposed like the people he's pretending to be like oh yeah that's like a much more compelling version of this fucking episode and drove me I, like it, five minutes in the episode I thought that was what was gonna happen and drove me up the fucking wall <laughs> I agree that that's a much better like he should have been the one giving the moral instead of Kyle saying everybody has anxiety and gets over it mm-hmm. yeah because exactly. that's a much more nuanced approach and they ultimately ended up taking yeah like i think with this a lot of stuff they didn't spell it out and you can kind of look deeper and extract certain meanings from stuff they did but like you said because of time they just didn't really drive any of their points all the way home right like let's boot a box give me more anxiety give me more tweak in that in that baby and then like all this mm. stuff becomes way more compelling or like minimize the anxiety thing give me more death in the pc babies and shit although i mean to be fair I, the muppet babies references were fucking incredible <laughs> so I, um, I, I read all of the like don't you have anxiety too and he seduces pc principal he seduces his mom eventually or or pc principal and strong woman are eventually seduced by this whole anxiety piece i kind of read that just as like it's it's the marketing ploy like everyone does have anxiety the marketing principle oh, yeah. is always like hey lean into that problem that you want to fix i wonder if religions themselves like i'm sure buddhism found its followers in that kind of message and the same thing with stoicism like it sort of gets this idea of like hey you have this like life is fucking terrible you're gonna have some remedy and here it is in this case but but yeah but it wasn't it wasn't like cleverly sort of thought through or or executed like it but you know they pull off these plots better when they can throw carmen against something Mm -hmm. you know when they have like someone who we can be like Carbon, the you know, like, I mean, I go back to the Tourette's episode, which I, I already, some other people I, I know have already talked to me about and mentioned for me to be this episode. Like, that episode rules because we see Carbon, so like, everyone playing with Carbon's Tourette's, and then we see real Tourette's people and are like, oh, wait. This <laughs> is reminds, fucked up that reminds, reminds me of like the Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where Larry David, he's like, oh, I can, I have an excuse to be an asshole. I can just say I'm on the spectrum. And so he's like a complete <laughs> jerk to the guy at the auto shop. And then he's like, oh, I'm on, I'm on the spectrum. And like, it's, it, yeah, it's like, this is, this is Cartman like just delighting and like, oh shit, this is my excuse to be a fucking jerk. I love it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And he does take any of those and he runs with them. And like, they, I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like this is the thing with this episode is like, I feel like the thematic execution was like very bad. But I feel like a lot of the joke execution was great. Like all the shots of Cartman failing to do stuff because he's in his Buddha box. We're super fucking funny. My favorite, of, my favorite line in the whole episode is when Cartman is talking to his therapist in the first few, in the first scene, and he's doing his mom's voice, and mom is like, "Eric, you have to shit," and then he's like, voices the words for his teacher. Oh, it's just it's so good. Speaking of that scene, um, and shouts to Nabrix in the Discord because I know he had this question as well. What did you guys make of the Black Panther thing at the beginning? Is that going to be a thing we have to care about? Like, what the fuck is going on there? So I feel like that is. Cartman and like Trey's way of bitching about the fact that a lot of things that become really popular are debatably like really mediocre right now because I kind of feel that way about like pop culture like when I watch like SNL I'm like is this really what qualifies as humor and I feel like it's kind of that sort of a thing. Okay, that makes a little more sense. But yeah, because I couldn't tell if it was like kind of like just a throwaway or if they're like kind of wrapping up that idea and just being like we're done now and I have a new motivation or if it was like a seed for like this comes up later. Well, you know, um, so just like in the first episode, then just disappeared for us this season until like right now, which seems like a weird. There's nothing yeah. Matt and Trey like better than calling out, you know, liberal Hollywood bullshit. And, you know, it's like the whole Clapter thing, which I think that SNL is kind of getting into a lot. It's like, oh, OK, they, they're they saying something political that you may, that if you agree with, then you're automatically uh, you have to like it. And I think it's similar with Black Panther. It's like, OK, well because of various representation principles that some people 
uh, adhere to, then you just have to like the movie, despite if you were bored to death during the first act, like I was. <laughs> oh, I like the first. Oh, I hope the transition to the second to third act is where that movie falls apart. I just, but anyways, I see. I just think the movie's only good when Michael B. Jordan lands in Wakanda. Then it's good. But the Except first part's well, boring. Well, we can go into this later because yeah. it has a fundamental failing of screenwriting, I think, in the back half. But um, the yeah, I just think that like it was. It's just a weird choice to go back to. I don't know. It feels like I don't know. It feels like a C, but it also seems such a throwaway. Very weird to me. They keep kind of doing that though, like very serialization light, where they'll reference to be like, "Hey, we didn't forget about that episode," but they don't really. Yeah, go the, any further, this I is bet. the second time yeah, that, like that the serialization stuff. Yeah, this is the second time that they basically kind of recap all the fucked up shit that's yeah. happened this season as a way to motivate mm -hmm. the plot of the current episode. Yeah, uh, are y'all are into that? How do you? Like, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> I mean, it kind of sums up the way I feel. Like I do feel spoken to <laughs> when they're like, "The world is complete." Like they've started multiple episodes just saying the world is completely falling apart and nothing feels real or good anymore, <laughs> which is kind of how I feel. So <laughs> I dig it. I think that they really landed on the perfect balance of serialization and being episodic. You know, they really fucked up with season twenty. And 21, they were kind of, I don't know, they kind of took a step back, but I think this is where they're not really tied to anything. They keep the elements that are working. They discard the ones that aren't working, and they're still able to make a, a, a cogent, complete critique of the current era, which mm -hmm. I don't, which if they threw serialization out the window entirely, I don't think they'd be able to do as nicely as they're doing right now. Right, because I guess part of what makes the critique function is that, like, we live in a world where I guess we're constantly bombarded by stuff all the time. And like, there's still piling on of shit that sucks. Um, and so by having them like be like, and now here's the list of things that suck. And it's even longer. This episode, I guess kind of works to like compound that idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a really direct way. That makes sense to me. I'm, I'm persuaded to enjoy this more. You know, we forgot to play Ryan's voice. Yeah. Mail. Let's pull it up. You want to, let's just do that now before. Let's just see yeah. What he has to say. What up authoritarians. It's your boy, Ryan. Just watch Buddha box. Gotta say, I think it was kind of a step back for South Park. To me, the whole idea of people spending too much time on their phones is like five years ago, <laughs> hot take. But uh, but um, and now it just seems kind of quaint and like, yeah, of course people are on their phones. I guess that's kind of the point. But uh, but also, and then they, they I, I did like. Oh, I think that was hmm. the wrong one. Oh no, he sent two and one. He fucked up. Well, whatever. All right. So Ryan didn't like it. As far as five years ago, I don't, I don't know. I think it's gotten worse. And I think that even in five years, these social media companies have become much better at capturing our attention with a scary uh, degree of, of uh, efficiency. Yeah. Also, I do kind of agree with Ryan, though, in that I don't think their critique – was necessarily any more nuanced than one could have been five years ago. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like, it's not as though they're, I think, Jared, I think you're right. That there's a lot to say about the way that phone culture has changed. But definitely five years ago, everyone was like, everyone's playing Candy Crush. <laughs> um, yeah. And like, that seems to be like the gist of the critique in this episode, rather than it being more about like, uh, Facebook is using your phone's internal operating system to trick you into using it all the time. Well, that's why yeah. I felt this episode. And the attention economy. That's why I felt this episode kind of went over my head because I was like, it seems that it's saying that because the world is now more fucked up than it was five years ago, people are treating their anxiety with their phones, which I'm just like, wait, are they? Is that why you're bringing this critique of phone usage now rather than five years ago? Because it just seems so obvious to me that obviously these phones only make it worse. Right. It seems a bit out of touch, but I wonder if, again, like if the if the actual phone itself or like be distracted by your phone does is not... It's not literal. It's just like it's some some device to tune out, or if it is like a but metaphor. See, I thought for Red Dead Redemption like... Two was such a better, yeah, yeah. better metaphor sure, for that. Sure, I think that is. I think that Jig is right. The phone is a metaphor in the same way as Red Dead Redemption Two. Like it's just the idea of like retreating to a digital world. I think, or but it's like too a, similar. A like, it's, but it's not. It's not a good enough metaphor because it's almost like because it's just not. It's it's um it's too close to the to the real thing that it's not accurate it just doesn't it doesn't because it, it, yeah, there's that phone. and it also has like there's there are real connections to real smartphones the things they're talking about in a way that like draws that connection it doesn't make the fact that it's a standard for something else kind of obvious because it's like too applicable by itself without the metaphor mm -hmm. 
also it, like, that that episode it, like makes some sense you know that episode about microtransactions that was like five years ago i thought that was i mean that's super relevant today as well but it was super super relevant when it came out do we think technology can promote uh calm or you know do you think that apps like no. headspace and all this kind of thing can actually work or is it just technology generally in your life is a is is going to produce more anxiety i think that connected like on the internet technology cannot i think that the that the connected nature the the whole idea of being able to be having the whole world available to your fingertips having every single person that you may ever love or desire or any idea that you have just always being immediately available and just having all these different metrics and how to determine your self-worth on the internet, that is going to always create anxiety. But I don't know. I think like a video game that's offline can be calming. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, this might come as a huge surprise to everyone, but I think that technology can fix all of it as long as the social and economic framework surrounding that technology is uh, not this one. Mm. Um, like, I think that like the way, like, like commodified and like, Financially and commercially, affiliated technologies are never going to calm people. It just reminds them of their position within like economics, right? Like, mm -hmm. if I'm listening to a podcast to calm down, and halfway through they're like, "Buy a new mattress." I'm like, "I can't afford a mattress." Oh, now I'm thinking about how I can't afford a mattress. This sucks, um, and stuff like that. And I think that, and like Jared, as you say, like this idea of self worth or value, like in a world where like our economic and social framework does depend on ideas of value and like personal worth in like an economic sense, then like yeah, you can never have these technologies calm people down, but in a world where like maybe that connection isn't the same way, doesn't operate the same way, then I think that you can use technology to calm people down. Cause I think that like we, there's science, right? There's like binaural beats and ASMR and a lot of like evidence on meditation, transcendental meditation, having like positive calming effects on people. So like the technology exists to do it. It's just that like the world in which technology fits is one that's designed to make you anxious all the time. I mean, on the forefront of all this, I, I listened to a podcast called The Buddhist Geeks, a guy named Vincent Horn. He's really interesting. He's, he's, at, he's talking about like what is consciousness and mindfulness and, and Buddhism in this connected age w with technology. And uh, there are plenty of, you know, tech developers who have gone into into Buddhism or into mindfulness and are creating non they're nonprofit apps they're effectively using technology to help serve as a catalyst for for um, for awakening or for for mindfulness and yeah those are those kind of bypass the issues that you're talking about like they don't they don't they're not ad supported they don't have like a random ad or they don't require you to pay a subscription to to listen and calm down i th i think that there is a yeah i think especially for people who are like not in big cities where you don't have access to this sort of thinking it does give you an opportunity to to calm down and practice that side of things. So I think it, yeah, it's like double edged. I think it, it works, but I think there's an irony as well, though. Like, not it's it's your one you complete your your meditation session, and then the next thing you're doing is is checking the news or checking YouTube or checking your comments or checking Twitter, and all of a sudden your anxiety is escalating. It still exists in that attention economy thing, and also the other problem is that obviously you're at least I don't know if this is true for everyone. My phone literally has like notifications about ads I could look at later. No. If I'm what? On my phone. Wait, wait, what, what? Say that again. Ads? Like, I get ads on my phone, like just notifications. will be like, Amazon has a sale on this thing you might want. I've turned what? off every what? notification what? on my phone. Oh, we've been, we've been throwing around. Oh, I said you got to turn those off, man. That's so creepy. That's fucked yeah, up. I don't know how to do that. So like, even if I had a free app to help me meditate, like I would still be <laughs> getting like, buy a drone. Give me, <laughs> give me your phone. I, I just turned everything off. I realized that I would open up my phone and I'd see all those red dots with numbers next to them. And I was like, that's causing anxiety. I just turned them all off. Like, yeah, and we've I, been, place, Jacob, I'm going to ask you to do that. We've been throwing around this term in the office, psychological warfare capitalism. I call it optimizing which, anxiety. Right, optimizing anxiety. So you would, no, in a normal market, you think of, okay, I'm hungry. I see a billboard that there's a sandwich. So I'm going to go buy that sandwich. And then I give them the money. They give me the sandwich. Both parties are happy. But now it's like... You're not even hungry. You see a billboard that is marketing a sandwich, and the billboard changes every minute to make sure it gets just the right color, just the right angle of the sandwich to optimize, to basically brainwash you in, into getting the sandwich. And basically it just keeps changing until it found just the right hue algorithm, of red. <laughs> just the right hue of red to where it triggers some sort of hunger in you, and then you're almost your free will is impinged upon, and you buy you the have fucking, no fucking sandwich. Choice. It's... Yeah, it's literally a war zone out there with advertising. Yeah. yeah. Marketing is like, a psyop. 
I feel like even though technology can like good, there are good apps and there are mechanisms for for calming you down. I don't think it actually happens that way because of what you're saying, Jared, because like when I'm choosing between surfing the web and like doing a meditation app, most of the time I'm going to go with surfing the web and fueling my anxiety. Because they have studied your behavior, they studied your eye line, and they know exactly what you respond to, and they will do anything to get you to click. And this is why the Buddha box, to get back to the episode, because I feel like we've been on a long tangent, um, <laughs> will would never work, right? Like Because if you're on your phone in perpetuity, um, if you're on your phone, then um, like you that, that anxiety that control that psyop of capital like is still going to be affecting you so that it, you're never actually getting away from like a real anxiety like you're just letting your brain be anxious in a different kind of way i mean if you're a child right if you're cartman then maybe this works but if you're like an adult who's connected to anything happening in the world like that's never going to really happen you're always about, be, like manipulating. yeah look yeah. at look at pc principal and and strong woman right like the by by being distracted they've caused like triple the anxiety now their fucking kids are missing right but it's only because they were absent i would have preferred if the buddha box something that they saw on the screen made them more anxious or right. basically mm. fucked up mm -hmm. what the goal it purportedly yes, is for the right. buddha box right in fact i say this episode suffers from like we've talked about this in like a bunch of our south park episodes on the on the channel before but like their whole like but therefore rather than and storytelling mm. um there's not a lot of therefore and and storytelling it's like or therefore and but like the pc babies thing is like the pc babies go to a bar and then they go to a construction site and then they go to a music studio <laughs> they're babies they have no will <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like you know like even carmen's character like he doesn't really run to obstacles and make and then decisions until the very end same with uh fucking the principal and the, the strong woman until they get like, till the kids go missing. Like there's just not as much like linear action in the story. I felt like at least in this episode, it just didn't feel as propulsive as like the rest of the season, which has been like very spot on in that respect. That's a really good point. And as I was watching it, I kind of felt like I was watching like a madcap heist film from like classic Hollywood, you know, like bringing up baby or, uh, some movies. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Like just movies where, the comedy just piles on top of each other. And as you're saying that, Lux, I'm realizing it, it's because everything was an and. Yeah, it really mm -hmm. did follow that structure in a lot of ways. But again, yeah. like the jokes were well executed enough that it didn't bother me too, too much. Like the Muppet, like the, the, the PC baby shit was like so well done for what they were trying to do. Like I said, I think that there's a better version of that story where they like play with the distinctions between types of PC, but like, it was fucking hilarious. And for instance, and there were little jokes I loved, like the fact that they used six names for the five babies. I don't know if y'all noticed this. I was writing down the baby names. That I <laughs> no, heard I them. did not. I was writing them down too, thinking, I wonder if they're, are they based on some like woke people or something like that? But they were just woke sounding names. <laughs> what were the yeah, names? Like they Emery. The classic, like, they were the classic, like 10 years ago, it was a name for a dog, but now it's a name for a kid if you live in Brooklyn. One of them Harper and one of them Lee. No, there was Riley. I have my list, and I could be wrong. My list, I have Riley, Bailey, Bumper, Harper, River, and Emery. Because Harper, I was thinking Harper Lee from To Kill a Mockingbird, and there's the character who's uh, Boo Rat. Boo oh, no, that's Boo Bradley. Bradley. Okay, never mind. I was going to say, is Harper <laughs> Lee even woke anymore after To Kill a Watchman? Or, uh, or to Go Set a Watchman? Watchman. Go no, Watchman. not. So, some of the jokes that I like the best, just getting, just like going yeah, on the sorry. jokes that it worked, I think. I, I mean, I'm I'm a sucker for this shit, but I liked the bar when he's like, what are you drinking? No, it's the Cosmo. I know it's a pussy drink. Now, this is supposed to <laughs> piss everybody off. It obviously pisses the babies off. It reminded me of a story. I was uh, working at a company, a software company. One of the, the leaders of this business, she was uh, awesome. She is a very strong woman, actually. I love this lady. She's awesome. She is really great. And so she's giving us like a pep rally. We had a big all-hands meeting, maybe 500 people or something, and she's like, and we're going to beat the competition. Why? Because they're gay. <laughs> and everyone went, oh. <laughs> and then she goes, and she's like, what? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I don't mean like homosexual gay. I mean like like gay, like weak. And everyone's like, oh, stop, stop. <laughs> they like they unplug the microphone. And uh, but and I, I just, I love a fucking sucker for that. That was so good. And I, I, as a gay man, I think that was a, a, that was just a good moment like of like, the intention is not 
is not cruel, um, but the the associations that are so burned in are just ironic. You know, they're they're yeah. It, and I think like this guy gets stuck. Like, oh, I know it's a pussy drink. Like, oh shit, I'm not. I can't say that anymore. I just thought that was a, such a cute little joke, and um, yeah, I just like I like that little bar scene was just a, one of those moments where I was like actually laughing out loud for the first time in this episode. See, I wasn't laughing because I felt it was so on the nose. Like, I, I all right, I get what you're going for here, and, and even though I mostly agree with the message because I am not really into PC stuff, but I just felt like it was done much better during the Mr. Hanky episode where it was yes. just that they're hey PC babies cry about everything. That's all you need to say. That's we don't true. need to see these examples. Yes, that's true. Well, but I do feel like, and again, this wasn't executed perfectly, but like Lux was talking about, I I didn't hate this episode the way I usually get kind of annoyed at their like PCness is the problem message because they more so than in the past distinguished between like superficial PCness and like actual like problematic things like mm -hmm. the commodification of Buddhism mm -hmm. or something. Right. Well, I and I did love the like like I love the construction work scene too for the PC babies <laughs> that like that like such a degree of research they would have never done, but also it's such a funny thing for them to be protesting. And the idea that like these construction workers like the 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 thing that the PC babies I like is that its characters had to explain to each other things they probably already know, which is like a nice commentary on like how PC stuff should work anyways, but also like it was mm -hmm. very funny how the guy's like, well, I guess they're protesting because they didn't want to fund anti-racist education. They're funding a viaduct, and they think that's hypocritical. <laughs> it's like a pretty funny position to put babies in. I don't know. I like the PC babies bit. I just wish they'd make it clear that it's the kind of PC people I don't like as opposed to the kind of PC people I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about the therapist at the beginning. I found this also kind of strange. So he said, young people have to deal with so much today. I believe what you have is anxiety. It's pretty common these days. What it really is is an excuse to be lazy and lame to everyone around you. Now, what I found weird about this is that usually it's Cartman that makes that jump. Mm -hmm. Usually it's that there's some authority figure who's full of shit who's trying to be earnest and, be earnest, and then Cartman then perverts it and takes advantage of it. But he's like straight up saying a therapist is saying that, yeah, it's all bullshit. It's just an excuse to be lazy and lame to everyone around you. It reminds me of the weed therapist, like, or the weed doctors who just like, oh, you've got anxiety, like, here's oh, another such, prescription. It, oh, it's such a joke. <laughs> or like your, I was going to say Woody and your emotion, as your emotional support animal, gives you a perfect excuse to just be able to fly with them. Yeah, I hope no one at Southwest Airlines is listening right now. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> there was a great article in The New Yorker about emotional support animals and, like, the limits you can take it to. And there was a person who, like, turned it, used a llama, I yes, think. Yes, <laughs> it, it was on a train, an <laughs> emotional support llama. Yeah, take it on the uh, subway yeah, in New York. I one of those. And I mean, this was another reason that I didn't hate the episode was that I felt as somebody like with anxiety who uses anxiety as an excuse not to do shit sometimes, <laughs> like I felt kind of roasted. And like, I feel like South Park is funniest to me when I'm being roasted in a funny way. Dude, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt this. I agree. I use my anxiety to get out doing shit fucking constantly. I've got an anxiety and, diagnosis. So, <laughs> I've got, we've well, all got one. Yeah, right. Well, I, no, I totally agree. I, I kind of felt the same way about how, well, you know, young people do have to deal with a lot today and anxiety really is something that people are dealing with today. But at the same time, the fuck are you going to do about it? You just got to, like Kyle says, get over it because what the fuck else are you going to do? Right. And you realize that nobody cares about anything you do or say. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kyle is saying like every this is normal. Like everyone, if everyone has the same diagnosis, that means that's more like normal. If everyone and, has anxiety, nobody has anxiety. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it's like it's that's neutral. Like everyone which has is, fucking stress. Which is why Lux's edit fixes it completely by having Tweak confront Cartman instead. And in my alternative world, that's what happened in this episode. <laughs> Well, I think that like, yeah, and I think that like, so even if like all once in a while I have like an anxiety thing where I like have to be alone, can't talk to anyone, I'm like having a panic attack that happens every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people will be like, hey, Lux, want to go see this movie? And I'll be like, oh, I'm feeling real anxious today, dudes. I think I'm just going to stay <laughs> home and uh, definitely not smoke weed and play Pokemon. <laughs> um, and like I do that fairly, you know, with some regularity. And so I really liked this episode. Like it did a good job of lampooning the ways in which like anxiety is a problem, but like it's not always a problem the way that people describe it as being a problem um and that's like why i want tweet to be in it to draw that distinction out because it's like you know 
you know, yeah, one you thing can be anxious, but you don't have to be like destroyed by it. And like Kyle says, you can kind of get over it for the most part, even if there are like occasions when you can't like for the most part. You really and even what can. Carbon says at the water park, he says, my therapist told me I need to force myself to go out and do things to overcome my, my anxiety. And I kind of feel like, yeah, if Matt and Trey are telling people like us to like, you know, fuck you, get over it, go out. I think if you do have adopt that opinion of fuck you, go out, you're going to end up feeling better than if you stay at home looking at your phone all the time. It's only going to make it worse. Right. At least according to my therapist, that's true. <laughs> so so there is a distinction in this episode between like the bullshit anxiety, which is everyone's got it and everyone's feeling it and, you know, it's an excuse. The only I'm, I'm, this just popped into my head, but like the only time where like there seems to be true anxiety, that's not just like, hey, there's a kids are annoying and kids cry and that causes stress. And, you know, Cartman's exploiting it is PC principal and strong woman are worried that people are going to find out that these are their kids. And they say, if people find out, then you're not PC and I'm not strong. And they've created, again, this label for themselves. And they're worried that people are going to find out the truth. And that's more of the real anxiety. And again, when they just sort of let it all go, it's fine, right? Or if no one's paying attention and no one gives a shit and you can let go of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm performing here, then they're fine. They're liberated. But that seems to be like the, the, the most gen – obviously, it's the most genuine anxiety of the show and that's the ending. Yeah, and, and we talked about this in an earlier episode because all of this has been brought up in previous episodes. The PC babies problematizing what Mr. Hankey was saying, even when I believe when Strong Woman is going into labor, they're driving over there and it's made clear that they can't live authentically because they're trying to perform these more socially expedient roles of being strong in PC. So I feel like it was just a lot of way more on-the-nose backpedaling. Like, I didn't need to hear... The cops say PC babies. They usually hang out at liberal arts colleges. You yeah, can find them joke, there. Right. It's just okay. Ha ha. I get it. Even though I'm like, yeah, I don't really like the kind of liberal arts college PC problematizing stuff. It still just wasn't a very good joke. Agreed. Yeah, it was not. Um, on Jacob, on what you said, actually, you raise an interesting distinction. Um, if I can be a philosophy nerd for a do uh, or sorry, Please. philosophy nerd dork for a second. Um, this is a safe Heidegger, space for philosophy. How do you draw a distinction between anxiety and fear? And what you're describing for PC principal and strong woman is actually what Heidegger would describe as fear because fear has a specific object, right? You're mm -hmm. scared of a pack of wolves. You're not anxious about a pack of wolves. Mm -hmm. um, anxiety for Heidegger can't have an object. It's like a universal thing. and It strips the world of kind of meaning because it positions it as all sort of opposed to you. Um, and, and sort of the uninterpretability of the world and the anxiety that comes with like the inability to like fully know the world around you forces you to actually be in the world. So for Heidegger, Anxiety is theoretically a potentially productive force um, because it forces you if you want to escape from like, what does he call it? Like the ocean. Anxiety is the feeling of like the ocean pulling away and revealing the sand underneath, right? If you want to deal with like the actual world around you, you have to emerge and engage with it and be in the world, like be the sign in Heidegger's words, words right? Mm. Um, whereas fear, like you're saying, the fear of PC principle, fear strips you of that ability because you have to cater that being to that fear to avoid it. Um, so like you're saying, uh, in Heideggerian terms, like the, is exactly spot on that the fear that that strong woman and, and PC principal have of being found out denies them the ability to access like a true authentic self. And that authenticity comes with anxiety. The broader anxiety is of like, what does this mean? Who are we now? What happens to our identity, et cetera. But it alleviates the fear that is like destructive of meaning. Um, Interesting. so that's a quick little, uh, Heidegger corner. Yeah, I identified a lot with those guys at, with the identity side. Like they've they defined themselves, I am PC, I am strong. And we can't allow those definitions to be compromised. I can't allow my identity to change, although we all change. But if I do, then all of a sudden it, it pokes holes and makes it causes, creates weakness in my in my identity. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've just thinking personally, I came out as gay, but I've had girlfriends in the past. I've, you know, I still find some women attractive. I'm like, oh, but now I have to come out again as a, a bisexual, you know, or I have to like, just I have like, to bend it. the rules. I'm like, no, <laughs> fuck it. I'm just gay. You know? <laughs> I'm just gonna ignore women now. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, it's, but it's, it's again, like you create this definition and whether it means political correctness or sexuality or anything else, like going back on that definition and identity is sometimes even more complicated and more fearful and more like anxiety prone than just sort of like what you know than just ignoring it and moving on and like yeah, these guys are sure. so uptight about their definition being compromised and like especially and, like these are rules i've created and that's why this episode even though it dealt with my least favorite plot line like in the last two seasons of south park it admitted like the absurdity of 
it, it, it admitted that it was all in their heads. And that makes more sense to me than like other people throwing up about PC principal and, and a uh, strong woman <laughs> hooking up like, but it, it, that doesn't make sense to me. And I still think that's stupid, but the fact that strong woman thinks it would destroy her, her image of herself as a strong woman does make sense to me. And is actually kind of interesting for all the reasons you just named. I think that yeah, that's like a, a, yeah. I really, it would be a much more compelling plot. Like them being like, if they're the only ones who care and the rest mm -hmm. of them don't really give a shit. Cause why would they give a shit? Right. And that's why I love this this ending so much. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, ending, the, like, the really ending kind of like a, more kind of hit me like emotionally in like twenty seconds than most of the rest of the episode gets done. I think that the the distinction here is, it's not that um, they ever they want to be authentic, right? Like everyone wants to be authentic. That's the sort of the the goal. Um, and it's in a sense like the 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 resignation in this episode here is not that they're trying to get everyone... Because, so, look, PC Principal's fighting. Like, we want to ban phones. We want to ban Buddha boxes. And and obviously, it's not working. Like, even in, in that speech, I mean, everyone is fucking distracted by the devices and distracted in these boxes. So he has to resign to the fact that they're not... That's not going to... I can't fix that right now. It's not going to happen. But then they take advantage of that distraction to say, hey, we can go seclude ourselves in our own little bubble, and now we are truly free. Because no one is watching. Everyone is distracted. This is actually a, a moment of of an opportunity for us to be authentic and for us to love each other. So I thought that was a really cool. Once they're off the radar, they can be authentic finally, and I like that because that really is Buddhism. In the sense. Well, they also the interesting thing is that what they are fighting for, PCness, is basically about inclusion, about allowing everybody to be their most authentic self, right. whether you're gay, trans, whatever. And yet they are pigeonholed into playing these roles, roles. not mm. unlike. You know, 50 years ago, a gay man would have to play the straight man role. Right, right. No, I th and I think that's pretty profound. I think that's really cool. Actually, we have a really good comment in that vein from the Discord that I just want to read you guys now. It's like, it makes more sense here than it would in the mailbag. And this is from Ra, God of the Sun, who says, hey, I think the most obvious message was that everyone struggles with the same things as everyone else to some extent. But you can't use it as an excuse to shut yourself off from the world around you because you'll end up missing out on the things that give real life meaning. Once everyone had shut themselves away, uh, PC principal and strong woman were finally able to live their lives in a way they really wanted and actually found total happiness. It seems like they're trying to live with masks on of their own making and they're trying to project an image of what they stand for, even if it's not necessarily who they actually want to be or how they actually are. Their beliefs are their identity, which I think is pretty spot on analysis of the ending. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. 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 It's like they've they've let go of what the any having to play any role and just sort of be. Yeah, be, that's awesome. be people, not images. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> fucking great. Uh, yeah. let me Yay to that. All right, let's go into some voicemails. So the number is 213-534-8807, or as a fan said, 213-ELFGUT07. You know, I, I oh, found a website right. where you can like type in, yeah, you type in the phone number and it gives you that. But the problem Elf is the zero. Zero is not good and one is no good. So right. those have no letters. So we got to maybe change the phone number or <laughs> just go with ELFGUT07. What is it? It's 213 Elf Gut 07. Yeah, great number. <laughs> yeah, great. It's so just <laughs> so easy to remember. Bag, so I was saving that one. For yeah, the 213 Elf Gut 07. 07. <laughs> Perfect. And here's uh, a, me a voicemail from Sam who's talking about this episode. Hey, what's up, Respect of My Authority? This is Sam from Altadena. And I want to ask you about this latest South Park episode, Buddha Box. Uh, I, I really liked it, but some parts of it were kind of. Uh, well, problematic for me. Like, it kind of reminded me of past episodes they did. Like, uh, for instance, the uh, Phil Collins uh, episode they did in season four where all the kids are being diagnosed with ADD because they can't stay awake through well, Farewell to Arms and The Great Gatsby. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all being put on Ritalin. And that's kind of... It seems like they're still kind of doing this thing where they're kind of not taking like certain uh, like basically like certain like mental conditions uh, seriously. And obviously Cartman is uh, doing what he usually does with uh, safe like with safe spaces, which is he's going to use uh, people's tolerance to mental conditions for his own uh, personal gain. But uh, it seems like they don't really take the anxiety issue seriously, and they think 
they should just get over it, just like they did in the uh, ADD episode where uh, Chef shows a video to the parents about how to deal with children with ADD, which is just to smack them and tell them to sit down and study. I'm going to stop the voicemail there. It goes on for another another minute or so. But I think, yeah, it's kind of some of the, the what we tread on uh, earlier in the episode. I think there. I, I think like what Amanda said earlier. There's value in being roasted on these things because mm-hmm. once again, if you give just unlimited sympathy towards issues like anxiety, then you're not actually giving people any motivation to go out and help themselves. Really, like if I'm if Jacob tells to me like, oh, I'm too anxious to go out. I'm like, you know, like, oh, okay, well, that's a a disease that has been prescribed or that uh, has been diagnosed by a doctor. Therefore, that's a line that I can't cross. I can't. You know, tell him, no, fuck you, get out here, and it would actually help him. So, I don't know. I, I had this uncle growing up, uh, my my dad's sister's husband, who was like blue collar dude, and like literally every time I had a problem, he would just literally punch me and say, "Fuck you, get better." And, <laughs> and uh, uh, what would a therapist say? I, I don't know, but I mean, it, back there. but like it would actually put a fire under my ass to do something instead of doing nothing and allowing the condition or whatever to, to be an excuse you. to do nothing. <laughs> And I'm not I saying think that's true. I also do think that on a personal level, Trey is probably somewhat cynical about mental illnesses. And I can see how watching this from this episode, from the perspective of somebody who's like, you know, maybe just been diagnosed with anxiety or really, really struggling with anxiety might you might leave it feeling a little bit belittled. But I, yeah, that makes sense. But I do think there's an element of hyperbole here. It's not that this is what he really thinks. I think that he's, you know, he's a comedian. He's an edgy comedian. So he's going a step far in casting doubt on these things, which I think we should be able to recognize and be okay with without saying that, like, oh, it's impinging on my identity as somebody with anxiety. I'm offended. And yeah, and also, I mean, come on, you can get a better identity category than guy with anxiety. Um, (laughs) But uh, I also think that, like, the the voicemail point had a really cool connection, which I think that another thing they react really strongly is this idea of overdiagnosis, mm. um, because like that was the ADHD thing, right? When the Ritalin thing was happening, was a time when like we looking back, people generally psychologists, psychiatrists agree that like we were overdiagnosing ADHD in kids um, and overprescribing stuff, and it's the same with anxiety now. Like a lot of people who I know, um, like do not suffer from like a tangible anxiety disorder, but they like are like. Sometimes I'm stressed and their doctor's like, here's a million Xanax. <laughs> um, and like, that's a real thing that exists in the world too. So it was like, I think that the episode does do a good job. This is, I mean, this goes back to why I just wanted fucking tweak to talk to Carmen for like two minutes. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it does a really good job of lampooning a subset of anxious people and ways of expressing anxiety that deserve to be lampooned. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give the other side of that in any meaningful way, which is a little frustrating, but I don't think is it a reason to like reject the episode on face. I think Jared's kind of right that like the show if this show never roasts you, you either think you're perfect, in which case, fuck you, or, like, you are the most niche person to exist. Like, you should get roasted by the show every once in a while. It's a good thing to, like, to have the show, like, check your, like, sense of importance. Like, that's a big function of the show, politic- like, in terms of its, like, value socially, is that it, like, checks back, like, the self-importance of, like, basically everyone. And I just so think... you should get roasted every once in a while. I think that everything, totally. including mental illness, it need Nothing is immune from lampoonery. And I think that every... We can't take anything too seriously, including that. I agree. I, that's yeah, why I, I mean, love this show. Bless it. Bless it. Yeah, they, have the ball, like, they have the balls even, to do it. And the, the, the yeah. permission. I mean, even as, like, a DSA organizer, social justice guy, like, I still fucking love the PC Babies thing, even though it's like, I'm definitely one of the people there. Right. <laughs> like... <laughs> I have to give you a, what a better name. What, what, I get to give you one of those baby names. What were the names again? Harper. Uh, we got, yeah, hold on, hold on. We got uh, Riley, Bailey, Bumper, Harper, River, and Emery. I, I mean, I think that you. if I'm one of them, I'm yeah, probably those a sound bumper. Like, <laughs> they sound more like <laughs> bumper. They, <laughs> they sound more like celebrity kids' names. That's true. Hey, so here's yeah. a, a message from a voicemail from Cody, our our patron and friend. Hey, authoritarians. This is Cody in Chicago, and I've got a quick comment about episode seven. Nobody got cereal. Love your show, by the way. So I don't know how Satan was treated in earlier seasons because I haven't seen, like, the whole show. So correct me if this is not normal. But in the episode when Satan gets beaten by Man Bear Pig, everyone is super sad. No one's running away from him. And I immediately read that as symbolic of the shifting morals of our society. Like, too. all the mm. quote-unquote sins that Satan represents are not really a concern to anybody. Like, nobody cares about, like, hypersexuality or religious blasphemy or pride and selfishness with social media and all that stuff. So um, what you get is, is like, 
that whole scene was being indicative of what our society is now concerned about, which is obviously the destruction of our planet, which is literal and not just an abstraction. Um, and by the way, this is quantifiable. Uh, so there's a professor <laughs> of cognitive science at UC San Diego named Benjamin Bruggen, and he wrote a book about swearing called What the F? And he's demonstrated in his uh, research that millennials actually no longer find vulgar sexual language offensive. Like, that's, it's basically acceptable, while slurs are not acceptable. And you guys mm. demonstrated this in your last episode when Lux was quoting an earlier episode of South Park and said the R word a few times. And Lux straight up apologized for it. If you go back and listen, he's like, I, you know, sorry to keep saying this word. So like, whether you're conscious of it or not, like, there is a shift in, in morals that, that isn't just, you know, some random kind of out there in, in the clouds thing. It's a real thing. Um, in fact, uh, this leads me to one question that I have for you guys. So I have a hard time convincing some people to watch South Park because they associate the show with you know, just Cartman yelling, you know, like, Kyle, you fucking Jew, and things like that, and calling things gay and, like, retarded. And this isn't just, like, far-left abstractions uh, of random people on Twitter. I'm talking about people I meet at parties and literally people I talk to at work that, like, won't give the show a chance because of, of this language. So I'm curious, is there a – and this is a question for all of you, but maybe especially Amanda – what do you say to people with that attitude? Like, I won't touch South Park with a 10-foot pole because of the bad words that they say that, that are offensive to people. Like, because I can't, I can't get people turned on to the show, and that sucks because it's really good. Um, anyway, love you both. Good luck figuring out which two of you I mean. <laughs> <laughs> dude, Cody's the best, man. Yeah, love dude, that guy. I love you can, Cody. You can tell that he podcasts every day. Yeah, that guy is he didn't have ace. one um. Not, not one. one. Not one. Wow. Love you, man. Yeah. I just saw him uh, last week or a couple weeks ago in Alabama. Oh, cool. He yeah. was there. Mm. He was there. It's a good dude. Uh, Amanda, what do you think? Do you ever run into this? Do you talk about South Park with some of your friends? Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like after, what, 23 years, if <laughs> somebody hasn't been willing to 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 listen to, to, to watch it, it might just there might just be no hope for them. Do you have um, to like come out as a South Park viewer? <laughs> 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 Everyone remembers their story. I mean, I don't know. I guess um, we have a lot of people I mean, in our office who don't. Part yeah, they of why hate we the like it is because it's divisive, and if people can't deal with that, then it might just be their loss. But I respect you trying to increase their viewership. <laughs> um, I actually run into this problem fairly regularly because a lot of my friends make fun of me because I record a South Park podcast every Thursday morning, <laughs> um, and they are like South Park. That show's dumb and for edge lords. Um, <laughs> Which is not entirely untrue, but also not entirely true because and, – and I, I've convinced a couple people to start watching with based on this premise that like regardless of how you feel about the show's politics, it's clearly been like an influential and relevant show for 22 years. And it's – as like a cultural artifact, it's super fascinating. The things they choose to talk about, things they don't choose to talk about, how they talk about them, where and why. So it's already like an interesting cultural artifact and the show is fucking 20 minutes of really good comedy writing almost every week. Um, and if you don't like the particular language, like that's, I think sort of missing the forest for the trees, you know? Um, and I've gotten a couple of people on board just by sort of being like, look, the, the show, it's okay to get roasted. It's okay for the show to say shitty things. Cause it's trying to make you think about stuff and thinking about stuff is like less and less. I feel like they have a coherent political platform and more and more is their challenge. Just like, Hey, critically think about stuff. Yeah. And I think that's the yeah. best. It's, it's like, you know, you got John Oliver and, and daily show and you have di all these different, uh, shows to talk like comedic avenues into current events and and what's going on and i just find this to be much more effective for me and it, it's, a, it's a much i, I don't it, it doesn't it doesn't like push that, that like promote a specific opinion down your throat so much as like just present funny ideas in a way that's like it's such a lampoon that you can kind of formulate your own idea but it's i think it's just it's great. But anyway, to Cody's question about the our changing or shifting moral stance. Austin, he talked about it with porn recently on our Mandy podcast. He talked about how, yeah, it's just, I mean, yeah, it, he talked about how porn is just, it's just cool now. Like, not even the religious right is, like, even taking up arms about it anymore. They've just accepted it. Yeah. And, like, everyone's Wait. cheering for okay. Satan, right? Everyone's cheering for Satan to survive and live. And I thought that in that moment, I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. Like, everyone is really sad that he's being defeated well especially because south park satan to get to cody's question about like who he used to be has always sort of been like a sympathetic character that's true 
and like pretty well liked. But I think I don't, I don't think that takes away from from this point. I think you guys are pretty spot on with like the way that social values are changing. Well, and, and like yeah, I mean, on the Game Boy Show on my my video game podcast, we do a segment every week called "Do They Eat Ass?" about which video game characters eat ass. <laughs> I don't think with like a a socially acceptable discussion to have whether or not like Mario digs butt. But, <laughs> I don't think that was like doable a couple of years ago, but now he it's like a plumber. Uh, totally <laughs> we introduce the segment. That's not even a joke. Does he eat Luigi's ass? I also feel like that's kind of a rebuttal of the like outcry about PCness. Um, Cody's point that we don't care about curse words in the same way we do. Like, we, I'm saying we, like, the youth cares about like offending people. But they're a lot more chill about a lot of other stuff. So there's that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna play one more voicemail. We've got a couple more here. I'm gonna play one from Kalani. He's our intern this semester, and then uh, and then we'll move on to the mailbag. I know just yeah, running a little behind on time. That. Hey, this is Kalani, one of the interns for Wisecrack, and this is for the Respect Our Authority podcast. Uh, I wanted to call in about um, last week's episode and the episode before, and the topic about um, Al Gore. And I think the reason why, like, Al Gore is, is, is present is actually because last year he released um, an episode, uh, a sequel to An Inconvenient Truth called An Inconvenient Sequel. And uh, I totally think forgot about that. <laughs> again, that's the reason why he was prominent here is because in that sequel, he basically shows, like, haha, I was right. Uh, you guys were all wrong. <laughs> Al Gore was right. Um, you guys should have listened to me. Exactly like what he says in the two episodes that he's featured in uh, South Park. And um, so I think somebody asked, uh, like, what is he doing right now? Al Gore, and it was that. He he released a a sequel. And uh, I also wanted to talk about how, um, like, they keep talking about how Al Gore really didn't know what to do. Like, they ask him what to do, and he says, I don't know, you should have listened to me. That's it. I think that actually is alluding to the fact that in an inconvenient sequel, he kind of just points and laughs at everybody saying that haha i was right but doesn't really provide a solution he talks about the 2016 paris agreement but that's like about that's like the gist of it like saying that we are taking steps to the future but he doesn't provide any solutions which i think is like being reflected in the episode this just gets to lux's um, point like he's just a dude how like they ask him for <laughs> solutions because they're like al gore you're the one telling us we were right you were you were right and that you had all the solutions, but you're not telling us what to do. I think I would like it if in the inconvenient sequel, he's just like in his mansion, just ch- kicking back with like a, dr- a drink with a small little umbrella in it, just talking about how he's right and we're all fucked. I just wow. looked- with like high tech anti apocalypse gear. <laughs> so I just looked it. Up. I just googled it, and it's an inconvenient sequel colon truth oh. to power. Which you literally you cannot call your movie Truth to Power when you used to be vice president. Like, come <laughs> on. I do want to clarify one Al Gore thing from last week because I made a joke about him talking about fix- creating the internet, and we got an email about how that's not technically true. I will say this: um, Al Gore did play a big role in the construction of the intranet, which is not the internet, um, but it was similar and maybe better. And there was a lot of discourse in the production of early internet whether or not it should be the internet or the internet, and that debate lasted into certain sectors for a long time so he has been annoying about it i just want that on the record wait are you saying intranet <laughs> versus internet yeah that was okay. a discussion okay. about what type of computer to computer network we should have whether it should be an intranet or an internet and what al gore created was the initial intranet it sounds like he's oh. saying the same thing intranet well yeah, I, th- yeah. I think yeah he was yeah, look i mean there's a yeah whatever there's a bunch yeah. of people probably responsible for building i know it was originally created for the military and i don't know if he was part of that but yeah he was part of like the initial like the internet being like computers talking to computers without like a human but interacting with them much whereas the internet is like computer human to human via computers and like outside of in the, between now it doesn't matter the basic so idea is he's is his he's, quote i invented the intranet and no, everyone just heard I, internet no, i don't think I so he said i invented the internet i think that he oh. just was like a proponent of like this discussion of his type of inter or intranet for a long time in a way that like was annoying. And he's a Regardless, blast. Of it, Basic internet idea. Not, he's Al a blast to make fun of. Douchebag. Kalani's voicemail proves it. <laughs> discussion note. All right, let's go into the regular mailbag. You can email us at southpark at wisecrack.co. Lux, what you got for us? 
All right, we got three this week, I believe. The first is from Quentin in Nebraska, who says, I love the podcast, but that's a given. Thanks, Quentin. I adored the Buddha Box episode, partly because the Carbon storyline reminded me of Japanese author, author Kobo Abe's 1973 book, The Box Man, which is a fucking excellent book. The book is about an unnamed narrator or narrators deciding to live inside a box and write about his experience as a box man and slowly go insane. It's been a while since I've read the book, but much of it is a statement about the fluidity of identity, anonymity, and separating oneself from society. It's also somewhat reminiscent of Japan's hikomori or shut-in culture, while also weirdly fascinating evaluation of the internet before the internet even existed. And yes, Jared, it gets very meta. Um, <laughs> I don't really have to look too deep on representing these concepts. I noticed some connections. It links well to Carbon's way to identify, want to identify himself as having anxiety as an excuse in order to detach from society and lose his identity, much like the narrator's intention of using the box identity to not participate in society. The episode takes the concept one step further by having the box concept become popular and spread like wildfire. Um, and then I'll skip the next part because it's just for elaborating that. And he says, with all these people detaching from society and living in their own world, it's easy to see the internet metaphor. Everyone's becoming anxious. Hell, I have Asperger's, so I dread having to talk to people on the phone. I ultimately do agree with Kyle's statement at PP's water park that anxiety is overdiagnosed and the answer is not to become a culture of shut-ins, but to get over it. Isn't to say we should be hard on people with actual crippling anxiety, but that's just me, okay? Stay cool, author sorry, stay cute, authoritarians. Peace out. Um, Great detail that it was called the PP Park. I missed that. It was, yeah, PP Splashdown. From, uh, it's from the episode where they filled with pee. <laughs> oh, isn't it destroyed what? in that episode? I guess they rebuilt it. <laughs> yeah, it's back, and also there are minorities again. Sorry, Cartman. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. What do you guys think about this idea of like shut-ins? Um, I guess we talked about this a little bit. This idea of like shut-ins and the difference between like anxiety as like a retreat versus anxiety out in the world. Um, also, every I mostly brought this one up so I can tell all of you to read uh, Box Man because it's amazing. it sounds it sounds really interesting. I have, I was not familiar with that. It fucking bangs. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think about this? About this idea of sort of retreating versus being in the world with uh, with this anxiety stuff? Mm. I guess we already it. talked about it a lot. Yeah, I guess I, I don't really have anything more to say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great easier email though. to retreat, yeah. but. It's also better not to. I'm uh, reading a book by Jack Cornfield. So he's like a Western Buddhist. And uh, yeah, this, a lot of um, the Western meditation practice and Buddhist practice is about incorporating like this. And similar actually in the psychedelic practices too. Like there's these like shamanic meditation practices where you take psychedelics and then there's this integration period of learning to to deal with anxiety on your own and then learning how to integrate that into the world. But I don't have much more to say than that, you know? Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a good, a good way to sum that one up. Um, I mostly want to talk about the box, man. Anyways, this one, next one is from uh, Antonio who says, just finished watching the newest episode of South Park. And I thought it was okay. Not the best and not the worst. Agreed. This episode provides the example of anxiety that Cartman believes to be a rare disease. Great irony is created as using your phone helps your anxiety, but also hinders improving and dealing with it. So when everyone is using the Buddha's box, there's no interactions and actually everyone uh, actually happening in the world because everyone's on their phones. The thing that's interesting is that a company creates a product to deal with a disorder that feeds into the actual disorder itself, the separation of them and the outside world. This product helps them consume more content produced by the market. Just a thought. Namaste to you all. Hey, fuck you too. Um, <laughs> from Antonio. Um, I think this one's really interesting because this gets at this idea of like a product that creates its own demand. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind is Bo Burnham's like extremely offensive joke about like uh, the people who make rape whistles uh, and how if their whistles work, they would go to business. <laughs> my mom used to sell rape whistles. Yeah, I thought she still did. I was going to say. No, she hasn't in a while. But I mean, she's she was very aware that uh, you know that to create demand, scare <laughs> tactics are, or, or you know, like yeah, it's fear helps sell. You know, she was aware of that. Yeah, I guess I just think it's really fascinating, and maybe Jacob made some into this into the way that like these like meditation stuff sort of like creates the fear and the demand for itself like it reiterates itself i don't know if you guys have any I thoughts think, on that i was gonna say yeah. I, think, I think that's religion generally I mean, again buddhism he was it was in 500 bc he says you know every life is suffering you have all this anxiety and there's a way out and that's the promise and in the same way with every other religion it's like you know, the the fear tactic might be hey you're going to have this moment of wrath you're going to have this moment of judgment and what side of, are you going to end up on? This is like for more on the Christian morality side of things or for Judeo-Christian Judeo morality. Like where are you going to end up? And that fear causes this like this this like panic to set in. And that's used in marketing all the time. Like, you know, your house is not secure enough and therefore you need an alarm system. And uh, whatever, you're not calm enough and therefore you need headspace. And, 
your whatever, you know, all these things. Your dog is is gonna have to is gonna shit its pants, and you're gonna have to get a dog walker. Like you're constantly feeding off of that stuff. So, yeah, yeah and I, I guess with religion in particular, like if if religions like a way to like quell your anxiety about the world being bad, but it also gives you all these rules that you're allowed not allowed to break that like reproduce that anxiety. It's just gonna drive you deeper and deeper in, I guess, in the same kind of way. Yeah, I think I I do think. Um, we have a an electrician here in the building who's working downstairs. He he provides us with great bread. But the, the long best, story, the, the best bread, best <laughs> bread. He got. Let me just step for one second. He was the electrician for a bakery, and they gave him a lifetime of bread. Then he built the next two bakeries. Now he has three lifetimes of bread, and the spillover comes to wise. And it's the best bread in town, right? But this guy, uh, his partner, used to be in the mafia in Italy, and he said, "I killed people," and I was like, "Oh, that's that's great." Uh, and, <laughs> and he said, "But he's found Jesus, and he's found redemption through religion." And I think. When, as he was saying it, he said, like, the more and more he studied Christianity, the more and more uh, aware he became of all the bad deeds that he had done. And so it, it, it kind of feeds on itself, right? Like, the more you think about all of these moral conundrums and all of these ethical dilemmas that you face and all of these mistakes that you've made, the more you unpack that, the more you're like, oh, my God, I'm terrible. Therefore, the more I actually need the antidote. So I, I'm like, I, I think it's, I was like, I didn't tell him this, I don't want to get killed. But I was like, I, I don't know if that's very good for you, buddy. Like, just, you know, you're good. You're good. You're a redeemed man now, I think. I hope. I hope. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I forgive him after Buddha all that did. bread. Yeah, the bread has, the bed, the bread has redeemed him. <laughs> um, next, yeah, the camp. The like, guy's never there when I'm in LA. Uh, no, you're coming, coming back. You got to come right now. But there, yeah. we, got, we got a big, a big load last night. Yeah, okay. like... Word, I'll hop on my bike. Yeah, all right. Well, we only got one left. It's from Ray, who says, "Howdy, ho, authoritarians! Thanks for uh, reading my email on the podcast. It'll be my claim to fame this year at the Cagatio. Don't know what that means, hmm. but I'm glad." This is the season of South Park's apology and resignation. But I wanted to defend the show after pointing out his climate denying stance, if that makes sense. I have many friends who work on climate change issues, and we all love South Park, even if it pokes fun at climate change uh, claimers. Two Days Before the Day After Tomorrow is one of my favorite episodes because it's hilarious, poignant, and, well, The Day After Tomorrow fucking sucks. Al Gore, an inconvenient truth, climate doomsayers, and that stupid movie have done more damage than helped the cause, so seeing South Park ridicule them was great for us. Moreover, seeing that mockery in those episodes has helped me moderate my tone as an environmentalist and try to be more informed, pragmatic, and approachable with the subject. They've made a better sustainability advocate or they have made a better sustainability advocate. And on top of that, they go and admit their mistake with two very funny and long-formed episodes. Sorry for the second long email. Oh, if you think this was long, right? You're fine. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge how much I appreciate this show that gives us uh, that gives a shit even after 22 seasons. Stay wise. You know, Ray just goes back to the reason to watch South Park is to occasionally see yourself get seriously roasted. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, totally. Um, cause like you said, I mean, I think this is a really, I think it makes a couple of really, really good points. Like the show, one thing that really struck me is, you know, like the show does give a shit about the world still, right? Like they wouldn't be saying they should have thing if they didn't care about people at a certain kind of level, which is like a thing I think people forget about with South Park. It does like, it's a really humanist show at a certain kind of point. I, I don't have the golf clap on here, so I'm going to have to do it. But yeah, it's like, I, I think that's really great. And I also think, I mean, for me, this is definitely true. I definitely have a bunch of really strong beliefs about, you know, economics and shit. And South Park does definitely help you learn how to talk about them in like a less sort of annoying way. I think it's great therapy. I mean, in a sense, they help you just reflect on like, hey, is this the thought or belief that you have? Maybe you're wrong. And that's yeah. effective. And just like, who am I and how do I sound to people is also kind of what we're saying, <laughs> which is yeah. good to think about. Definitely important. But yeah, so that's all of our emails. Thank you guys for emailing in. Um, it's uh, South Park at wisecrack.co, and we'll have more of them next time. Or 213-ELF-07. Elf gut. <laughs> Elf gut 07, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, 213 Elf gut 07 or 213-534-8807. Anyway, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up today. So thank you to Amanda, Lux, and Jacob for joining the podcast today. We'll see you guys next week with Season 22, Episode 9. Guys, it's going by so fast. I we know. only got two more episodes. It's sad. It it's is no, sad. It's going to be so sad when we're done again. Yeah. Well. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Screw you guys. We're going home. Peace. Later. Later.